My name is Charlie Siggs and I'm commercial agronomist at Constella. And today I'm going to be talking to you about agriculture's temperature and what does it tell us looking from a thermal infrared point of view from using satellites. And about Constella, um, so we have a mission to measure temperature, water, soil and carbon from space. And we were founded in 2020 and we have around 60 employees with our head office in Freiburg. And we also have an office in Brussels plus one in Munich as well. And last year we launched our first asset into space onto the International Space Station. And we also acquired ScanWorld, an expert in hyperspectral satellite technology. And we'll be launching our first satellites of our constellation in 2022. Um, so we'll be launching a constellation over the next few years of thermal infrared and hyperspectral satellites. And we support and we collaborated with uh, key European stakeholders in the space industry and also in European and global agricultural industry as well. And so the world needs to improve its crop water management by, in order to feed a growing population as our global resources, including water, are becoming scarcer and scarcer. And agriculture is seeing more frequent droughts and heat waves, which is causing increased levels of stress on crops and severely impacting our yield and ability to grow crops in specific regions. And this combined with increased costs of water um, is putting immense pressure on farmers' ability just to maintain the yield, let alone improve it. And in order to confront the ever-increasing challenge of water scarcity in agriculture, we first need to be able to monitor crop water usage accurately and in a scalable way. And we need to do that by collecting data on water cycle, and we need to do that in order to effectively manage and reduce the impact of water shortages that we're heating, we're seeing, and also increased temperatures. There are management practices that can help with this scarcity in the agricultural industry. And these include more precise and timely irrigation, uh, using new crop varieties that have better drought tolerance and heat tolerance as well. Also by applying biological stress management products to the crops and the adoption of regenerative agriculture, which has multiple benefits in improving soil carbon, which is increasing the water content of the soil, and also significantly reducing the temperature of that cropping area and helping to manage in those stressful conditions. And we need to be able to measure it because as Lord Kelvin once said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we need to be able to measure that water usage in order to improve our agricultural systems to feed a growing world. And there are several ways to assess crop health, which we've been doing remotely using satellites for 50 year, over, over 50 years now. And ways of measuring it, there's precise measurements in field using sensors, taking soil samples and analysis, and weather stations to drones and airplanes. These give very good insights but are not useful for large-scale monitoring. And so for large-scale monitoring, we need satellites. It's the answer. But there are still some drawbacks with those. Current satellite systems are very good at observing details, for example, crop colour and growth via indices such as the Normalised Difference Vegetation Index. And this means that current methods of crop monitoring rely on symptoms that occur days to weeks after that stress has actually started to occur on the plant, such as a lack of water, insect damage, disease, heat, and so forth. And greenness indices such as MDVI are useful tools for monitoring crop growth and even helping with yield prediction in the growing season. 
they fall short later on in the season when the crop starts to flower and when the crop is starting to become saturated and it's very difficult to get any feedback and data on there where we can see differences. It's also often used NDVI as a proxy for vegetation related variables, such as water content, chlorophyll content, crop growth rate, yield prediction and disease, disease detection. Each of these parameters being independent, it can't represent an accurate proxy for all variables at the same time. We need other data sources to build in there to develop accurate proxies. And crops with comparable values could actually be in very different geographic locations. To make a comparison, when we'd like, it would be similar to looking for a new house by only looking at the price. For the same price, you can rent a small apartment in a city centre or a large house in the countryside. The price alone is a poor proxy for localization and size. It's also similar using these current proxies we have as a doc is with a human went to go and see a doctor. And a doctor trying to diagnose your illness by only looking at you from the outside. Instead, a doctor will ask you a series of questions about your symptoms. What you've been eating, they will take your temperature, measure your heartbeat and perform other tests. And advances in medical imaging have significantly improved the accuracy and speed of diagnosis. And we can see things a lot earlier now and treat them more effectively. And this is something that needs to happen in agriculture and we're on the verge of. We're currently in a status where we're detecting diseases and problems after they've happened and before we can take any real remedial action that will help improve and maintain the yield of that plant. We need to have a way to do that. And this is what Constella is doing. So Thermal and Fred provides us with a game-changing insight into crop health and the ability to take actions that will protect the crop. So when a crop becomes stressed, the shortage of water, um, the plant reacts by closing their stomata and decreasing the rate of transpiration. This leads to an increase in temperature which can be measured using a thermal infrared camera. So going back to the human comparison again, as you're seeing a rise in temperature, an indication that something is wrong. This stress and resulting rise in temperature starts to happen well in advance before it can be seen by the naked eye or a proxy indices. So we can see uh, symptoms of stress using thermal infrared and a rise of temperature days, and in some cases weeks, before we would actually see a visible symptom in the field, such as wilting of the plant. And this gives a grower sufficient time to take an action, make an application of a product or do some action, which will actually help to maintain and in some cases increase the yield and prevent their yield loss. So this is protecting a large percentage of yield, whereas currently where they're looking at um, C imagery where it's already damaged, they're not able to protect as much yield as they were if they'd be able to see it before the damage was visible. And crop temperature is also a very important variable for yield prediction. Yield prediction is becoming more and more valuable for organizations across the world, from governments to food companies and farmers in particular. And we need to ensure that for it's needed for food companies to help ensure that they can source all of the raw ingredients they require, for governments to forecast how much food supply they will have and where they need to source from, and for farmers to know how much that they're going to have to sell so that they can advance sell and obtain the optimum price for their produce. The current crop temperature available for these models is limited by spatial resolution, accuracy, and temporal frequency. A lot of temperature data is taken from weather stations. We also have it available from satellite missions too. But these are currently limiting the yield predictions in terms of the spatial area that they're providing them for. 
a lot of them are only going down to areas such as a US county level, which is a long way from the field level insights that we need in order to increase yield and then maximize yield prediction so that we know what is being produced. The crop temperature also enables us to measure other parameters such as evapotranspiration, which can be combined with other data sources to predict when water-related stress will occur. Thermal infrared satellite imagery is publicly available, but there are current limitations on frequency, resolution, and temperature accuracy at present. Either satellites are able to obtain imagery at a high frequency, but a low spatial resolution, so not at the field scale, but it's over 250 meters per pixel, for example. And that's not applicable to, for a farmer in order for them to make an action. Or they have a high resolution, but they have spatial resolution, but they have a low temporal frequency. And so if we're looking at like frequencies of once a month or once every two weeks, that's not sufficient for us to be able to monitor a crop and then for a grower to make an actionable decision. So there currently isn't anything in between that's serving that market to help advance this monitoring of temperature within the agricultural industry to help make actionable decisions. At Constella, we're building a constellation of satellites that will provide daily measurement of land surface temperature at high temporal frequency, high spatial resolution, and high radiometric accuracy. We are focused on developing a, conservation, a constellation that will serve the agriculture industry, delivering measurements that will enable improvements that meet the challenges of the future. Our first tip in this journey started last year when we launched our LISA products onto the International Space Station. This thermal infrared cam camera has captured millions of high resolution images with high radiometric accuracy over the past year one of which can be seen in this slide from Sacramento, California. We can see immediate value from this imagery, where at the top of the image, we're seeing a crop there with comparison, where there's a higher temperature on one field compared to the other. This could be an indication of stress in that crop, um, which can be immediate, mediated with an action. We are also looking into other industries as well, such as monitoring herb, urban heat islands, and the other image we can see here is showing on a golf course where there's irrigation, a much lower temperature being monitored. So with this information, we're able to like mainly folk, we're mainly focusing on agriculture, but there are many other industries that we can benefit as well. And the images captured um, from our device provides us a vast amount of insights into the variation that we can see in just a very small area. This one is taken from New South Wales in Australia, and you can see in this there is a large amount of variation in a very small number of fields that are right next to each other. And the, what this data can tell us is that we can show that to farmers and then combining that with advisors and other people in the industry help them to improve their water management and their soil water retention by observing these practices, providing them with data, and then they can use that data to make informed decisions on how they can improve the management to improve the water conservation of that soil and to help maintain the crop and to manage stressed situations. And in this, image we can see where there's bare soil where it's brown that there's higher temperatures compared to the where there's vegetation and showing that where you have vegetation that there's more evapotranspiration which is a, providing a cooling effect for the soil and a study in southern France found on regenerative agriculture found that during the hot summer months of July and August, on fields where regenerative agriculture was practiced, that the temperature was two degrees Celsius lower than those where there was bare soil where it had been plowed. And this was due to there being straw and vegetation residue left on the surface of the soil, which was reflecting more um, sun's radiation than the bare soil. 
and keeping it cooler and retaining more water, which is beneficial for the autumn planting and helping to keep areas cool locally. This is of high value, particularly in terms of climatic monitoring in local regions to see what practices and what changes in physical structure can help improve that environment and keep us within the 1.5 Celsius that we need to within the next few years. The next slide, this shows the same like area of Sacramento, but this is looking at a rice fields. Rice is a crop that's coming under more pressure due to its high demand for water and the levels of methane that are emitted from rice paddies. Farmers are implementing new practices that reduce the amount of water that they use, which results in lower emissions of methane. And satellite-based land surface temperature enables scalable measurement and monitoring of these practices, enabling growers to demonstrate what they're doing is having a positive environmental impact. Growers in rice now are implementing new water conservation practices, introducing drip irrigation and so forth. And also in other crops such as cotton, customers now want to be able to measure how much water has been used in the crop for reporting to show that they are working with farmers that are doing sustainable practices, which are reducing the water consumption and the environmental impact of crops such as cotton. And combining that with images, we're using land surface temperature, well, not only that, but using that with um, sensors in the field provides a scalable way of accurate measurements of effects on temperature and water use. And we also looked at that across the season. And this was a trial looking at different, the impacts of different irrigation methods on maize and that impact on temperature that we can monitor throughout the season. And so the chart in orange at the top was lightly irrigated. And then the blue one was fully irrigated plot. And the purpose of this trial was to simulate stress within a maize crop to follow that. And the reason for doing that is that it enables us to understand the crop during that season and to when to make management practices that can improve that and also bring products to the market which can help with water stress and detecting them. And also for us to help to classify environments and what the variation is within them. And with our current measurements um, with visual satellite imagery, we're able to see those differences. But when, when we get to later in the season, when there's full canopy closure, there's less difference. And being able to monitor at a very high resolution rate, we're able to see that variation across the field. And in this case, we see it that in the hot summer months of July, in late July, where there was light irrigation and full irrigation, there was a difference where the light irrigation was 5.3 Celsius warmer than the fully irrigated plot because there's less water available to the plant and becomes stressed and the temperature rises. And this data is incredibly valuable, as I said, to enhancing yield prediction because we're able to collect this throughout the season and see the variation in the field, which we're not able to do currently with in-field sensors. So we need to do this in order to understand what's happening with the crop, observe this and deliver more accurate yield estimations so that we know what the crop production is for a certain region. And crop irrigation is becoming even more and more challenging due to increased frequency of droughts and also reduction in the levels of aquifers, uh, Texas being a prime example of this. And growers are having to move from their old methods where they would go and visit a field, assess it to see, okay, what the level of moisture was and common practices where they apply the irrigation at set times and set rates each year. 
there are sensors available which help them to do this, but they're lacking in terms of that spatial resolution to inform the grower and what to do. And from with land surface temperature and high accuracy and high resolution, we are able to derive from that a evapotranspiration rate. And from that, we can do calculations and then growers can be more precise with where they irrigate and how much they apply and also the timing for that crop. And also in terms of monitoring in terms of the total crop water usage. So enabling growers to continue to irrigate in areas where there's water shortages more optimally. And it's also a massive uh, data point for various other models, particularly for predictions of when there will be crop water stress. And it also has a high level application for soil organic carbon estimation. The soil organic carbon market, carbon credit market is rapidly expanding, but measuring soil organic carbon requires a lot of resource and a lot of time. Multiple measurements need to be taken across a field um, to come up with an estimation of that field's total carbon levels. And this is often in a grid system where they will have to take maybe one sample per hectare. And what thermal enables us to do is to assess the um, and provide an estimation of the carbon levels within a field. We can do that and provide okay, estimations in those levels and then divide it into zones where it's similar across them. So homogeneous zones. And that enables someone to go and take fewer samples which is saving them time and cost and making carbon credit a lot more scalable and also enabling to see, okay, what is the potential of that field from a carbon uh, sequestration point of view? And this combined with hyperspectral in the future will provide us like a lot of insights and in particularly remote regions where we don't have a large amount of data on what the potential is of soils and what the carbon content is, also organic matter and crop nutrition, and also water um, holding ability of that soil. So agriculture has benefit, benefited greatly over the past 50 years from satellite observations, making it more precise and making it more efficient. At Constella, we aim to continue that journey to provide farmers with new insight and measurements that will empower them to make actionable decisions to tackle the climate issues ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, as well. Uh, thank you for the insightful presentation and uh, some questions that uh, have here from, from my side too, maybe while we still have a few minutes. Um, because maybe, who knows, maybe we have some, some of the people that are watching here live, or if you're watching the recordings, if you're coming from the agriculture background, maybe some of those questions uh, would be valuable for them to also uh, to hear before they actually are going to go and reach out to you personally, because there's also a function for you to follow uh, uh, Constellar also on social media. Uh, you're going to find the website, phone number included, but also there is a function for you to get in contact with Charlie and set up one-on-one -on -one uh, discussion if 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 uh, you're looking to explore more of uh, Constellar services as well. But the question is here as follows, Charlie, is uh, can temperature data be used uh, to predict the uh, the onset of pest outbreaks or disease in crops? And if so, how? Yes, it can. So with um, the pest outbreaks in particular, there are several models available, which um, when you have increases in temperature, and that accumulates over time, then there's prediction in terms of a pest outbreak, um, aphids in wheat, as an example, or barley. And as we see the temperature increase at certain points, then it accumulates and we can do that. And so by with land surface temperature, it enables more spatial, accurate, looking at um, down to like a 50 meter level, um, to say, okay, what the pressure is in a certain region. So helping to make weather systems and predictions a lot more um, accurate too. And we can also see in terms of that rise in temperature as well, potentially, that there may be like a potential um, infestation of pests. And with diseases, 
we're able to, it's also yeah feeding in particular into models making them more spatially um accurate and um combined with other data improves those and again we can see yeah, that stress as well so we need other data factors to come in but it's combined it's it's a factor that's improving the spatial accuracy and also the the timeliness as well um to see when those can happen and also talking about the 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 temperature patterns and and the, as the question follows how does the climate change uh, impact the temperature patterns in agriculture uh, in agricultural regions and what implications does this have for farmers mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we're seeing uh, a lot more heat waves and also yeah, drought conditions. So that climatic change is um, particularly impacting. Um, one of the biggest factors is when plants are pollinating. And if you have too high a temperature um, and you don't have enough water, that has a big impact on the yield for a grower. Um, it can have like massive impacts, particularly the pollination pollination period if it gets over um 35 to like 40 degrees um in a lot of crops uh, from them so uh that's a big um impact and then also the temperature um well and has a, another big factor um in terms of a planting time too um because if we get a very cold period as well that affects the germination and the establishment of a plant it can't grow as much um in colder temperatures and um so there's a large amount of um, factors that were happening there. And um, so in areas, semi-arid areas like in Spain, California, and those areas, we're seeing a lot more drought and um, high temperatures, which are impacting yield um, particularly. And um, then we're also seeing, yeah, increases in disease rates and insect infestations in other areas where we've um, got more moisture. So probably in, in North Europe, there would be a higher rate of um, disease um as an example you you also mentioned the heat the heat waves i mean and, and that's part of the climate change as well so uh talking about that temperature uh you know variability and and the impacts uh, that it has on the different types of crops uh so how can farmers adjust their management practices according to to the changes that we see so if they implementing regenerative agriculture is um helping to conserve more moisture um, and water within the soil. Um, by increasing organic matter, that holds onto more moisture there. So that keeps it in. And um, as I mentioned in France, where they did the study where you have um, dead vegetation from the previous crop covering the soil, that helps to keep it in there and keep it cooler too. And there's also new um, maize varieties and hybrids coming to the market which have improved um, drought and stress tolerance, um, which they can use. And also um, products which they can apply via sprayers, um, which are biological, and they um, have a effect on the biological response of the plant. So they help it to manage stress um, through, through the production of amino acids and enzymes um, within there to keep it more. Um, so, that's there's some of the ways and the other the other factor is to diversify their cropping so they're not dependent on one particular crop in particular we have a lot of farm areas where they're a lot of monocultures and the farmers say growing just maize in a lot of parts of north america which needs to be more diversified um in that region to have less risk to um climate change and temperature fluctuations <laughs> 